Hello, my name is Crystal Dahl and I am the Online Communications Specialist here at Meritas. I would like to welcome and thank each of you for joining us on today's webinar, How Businesses Can Benefit from the New Canada-EU Free Trade Agreement. Today's webinar is a bit of an, a unique experience with regards to our capability webinars. The two presenters will not only be speaking to you online, but also be speaking to a live group in Vancouver. Before we get started, I would like to go through a few housekeeping items. Meritas now offers the ability to listen to our webinars through your computer speakers. If at any time you have any difficulty hearing the presentation, you may call into the associated telephone line instead. All phone lines will be muted. If you experience any technical difficulties, please press star zero at any time to connect with a support technician. Lastly, um, excuse me, if you have any questions, you're also welcome to use the chat feature found on the right left-hand side of your screen. Um, questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Lastly, in the next few days, I will distribute a copy of the presentation, a recording of the webinar, as well as Bruce and Didier's contact details for you to reach out to them directly if you would like. With that, I'm going to pass the controls over to Bruce in Vancouver so that he can get started. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Bruce Harwood, and welcome to the Canada-European Free Trade Seminar, which I will be presenting with my colleague Didier Culat. This is both a webinar and a seminar, so we would ask that all questions uh, that are forwarded uh, for our uh, consideration are held until uh, we finish, which is uh, roughly 9.30 this morning. Um, this is, as I say, a 90-minute presentation. And we are uh, somewhat under the gun in terms of getting our information out to you in the time allotted. So uh, by way of introduction, uh, my colleague DJ Culat is a senior member of BCF, which is a Montreal-based law firm founded in 1995, which maintains offices in Montreal, Quebec City, and in Barbados. Didier was born in Lyon, France and raised in Vancouver. He holds a bachelor's, a bachelor's degree in political science and international relations from UBC, as well as law degrees from the University of New Brunswick and Laval. He's been a fellow of the Institute of Canadian Bankers since 1988. He was a student in the legal department of the Canadian Intergovernmental Affairs Secretariat and the Ministry of International Affairs. He's eminently qualified to speak on today's topic. And without further ado, DJ, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you all for, for uh, coming out this morning. Uh, and thank you for those who are participating uh, through uh, the, the, the web conference. Um, I, I, I start uh, by just kind of giving you a context. The conference site is, is uh, Canada, EU, FTA, Canada Today, USA Tomorrow. Uh, everything that's taking place is uh, in a context where there was an agreement that was signed uh, between Canada and the European Union on September 26, 2014, and there's an ongoing negotiation next day. I'll give you more details later, but it, it, it creates an interesting context where there's an opportunity for uh, Canadians and Europeans to, 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 to work this together, and, and it's a, it's a, it's a prime ground for the Europeans to basically enter the rest of the United States market. Doing business in Europe, doing business in Canada, and the United States is, is two different ballgames, and, and uh, both sides of the Atlantic need to kind of uh, stimulate that. And, and, and so, why free trade? Why? What is my interest when when, uh, when Bruce goes down that my better be speak? It's always been an international aspect to um, how my career has, has advanced, and it starts starts pretty much uh, as a child uh, when when we moved to Vancouver. Uh, my parents uh, became involved with me, Clark's parents who's here at, at the table, and um, they were importing from, from Europe, mainly France, but from Europe, um, uh, food items that are today running the mill, things that you're going to find in your pantry, but at the time in the late 60s and early 70s and through the 80s were, were, were brand innovation. So stuff like uh, Jacquier and Bonneval were, were first brought to Canada by this business. And so they were very much the uh, trailblazers of that, that kind of uh, bilateral trade uh, with Europe and, and Canada. And so I grew up in it, came 
who else in it. And so here we are today to see where where this all goes at, at the next step. So uh, yeah, you just click on the back of the oh, we'll see that this arrow here, right here. Okay, yeah, that should do it. So I'm going to talk about the Canada uh, uh, EU uh, FTA context. Uh, some of the highlights. Bruce is going to talk about temporary uh, entry of business persons, and then we're going to some practical advice and takeaways that that uh, has uh, one of the messages is this thing's coming. This is a grand opportunity. You need to be prepared. You don't start doing business in Europe or the tourists to take pictures there are plans that need to be put in place and 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 some very practical considerations that, that you need to really uh, uh, consider. And and the same is true for the Europeans. The same type of, uh, of strategic advice that, that they should also be uh, considering. So um, September 26, 2014, the free trade agreement signed uh, in Ottawa. Uh, it's important Sign. I'll get into what, uh, about it, or whether when it will become enforced and the process that has to follow. But it's a comprehensive free trade agreement. It's just not just a reduction of tariff barriers. That is probably the most um, notable uh, feature of it. 98 percent of all tariffs will disappear day one. That that contrasts itself to when we did the free trade agreement in the United States in the late 80s, um, where tariff barriers uh, were reduced over a seven-year period. When we met it out with the the effect of inflation, no one felt anything in terms of the impact. Whereas this is 98% of all tariffs are at zero day one. But there's more than just trading goods. There's a trade in services. Uh, there's uh, trade in investment. There's uh, uh, a widening of the government procurement uh, abilities. And, and on the government procurement side, I mean, this is a great way uh, for a business to enter a new market. Uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll get into to, to, to that. There are dispute settlement uh, provisions. Um, that's always been something that's important to Canada. Uh, one of the reasons we got into the free trade agreement in the United States in the late 80s is that there was none, so we were uh, subject to unilateral action from the United States. So since, uh, since then, there's always been a dispute settlement mechanism, state to state and investor to state level. Um, intellectual property protection and sustainable development coordination. This is this, what is significant, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll see the details of it, but this is the first uh, free trade agreement that Europe is concluding with a G7 country. And obviously, most, most of them are, are, are in Europe, but still, you know, there are, there are big players out there that, that are not in their economic, uh, direct economic circle. The United States, Canada, Japan, this is the first. Um, obviously, as I said, negotiations started since July uh, 2013 with the United States. And we don't know how, the, how this story ends, but uh, when, when Canada had a free trade agreement with the United States, um, it was supplanted uh, several years later by the North American free trade agreement. Uh, and, and what they did is they just basically uh, took the old one and said, well, there's a new one that supersedes, and uh, forget what we wrote about the old one. In fact, what, what it, in fact they did is they took the 87 agreement and then they, they uh, 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 amended it uh, and create a, uh, a larger agreement and to alleviate the concerns of what could happen in, in that process. Um, so here's kind of like how do we how do we how do we get here? How can we have a free trade agreement with with uh, uh, the European Union? Well, it goes back to basically uh, World War II. After World War II. It's kind of you know in 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 the, in the whole context of the Marshall Plan and the rebuilding of Europe and the rebuilding of Japan, and there's, there's kind of uh, and and the containment policy in the United States used to be the the Soviet bloc, um, an attitude where we need to share the wealth. We need to make sure that what we've gone through will never happen again. It's kind of like a peace dividend. So we are going to trade amongst our friends. We're going to reduce trade barriers, and and the vehicle for that. This is the General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade signed in 1948. But what the General Agreement was was a framework for sectorial negotiation. And every couple of years, well, not every year, maybe five, six, eight years, there were new types of agreements in different fields. So, an example, um, there, there, and they were called, they had different names, like they had the Tokyo Round, the Kennedy Round. Um, uh, and that the Tokyo Round was a reduction of trade barriers in government procurement, saying that you had to have these, uh, a certain 
ruled over a certain uh, uh, threshold and that the, uh, you couldn't discriminate on, on origin and, and there was obviously recourse that was available if someone was discriminated against on that basis. So that's the general agreement of tariff trade. And the gap was replaced in the early 2000s by the or late 90s uh, by the uh, uh, World Trade Organization, the WTO. But by then, everyone's in the WTO. It's not just the allies uh, and their friends from the, uh, the end of World War II. Everyone's in it. And so cons uh, the consensus at reaching agreement is much more difficult. Last round of negotiation starts in 2001. It's called the Doha Round. Started in Doha. Um, and they negotiate until about 2008, and they kind of realize we're not, we're not getting anywhere. We can't reach that consensus. So there's, there's kind of like a parting of ways in, in terms of approaches, and people go off, and countries go off, and, and are starting to conclude what I would call a regional or sectorial um, agreement. And in that context, there's a whole process that follows through uh, October 2008, where you have a, a joint study uh, done, uh, a, a defining scope report in uh, March 09. Negotiations are launched in, and, and this is where you realize this is a long process. Negotiation launched in Prague in May 2009, and it took to October 2013, so four years, to have an agreement of principle. And and we'll, we'll see, uh, uh, and in September 2014, an agreement is signed, and it's not yet in force, it's coming, and, and that's part of our message where we say you need to be prepared for this because it, 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 it's on its way. So I'm just going to run through this quickly, but Canada was not always a free trade country. Uh, it, there were uh, numerous tariffs, uh, there were non tariff barriers, quotas. Um, access was, was very much, uh, uh, the Canadian market has always been very limited uh, on a historical basis. And really, everything really changes in 1985 when there's the report of the Ogawa Royal Commission, which proposes a free trade agreement, also proposes a, a, a GSP, um, which we could have another discussion on. But GSP replaced another tax, which is the manufacturing tax, which is at 13.5%. So it went from 13.5 to 7 and only on the domestic market. But that's, that's, that's for another conference. But what, what it does is it, it creates a, the movement for the Canada-U.S. free trade agreement in 87. And then here's where you see that Canada has, created, has done other uh, free trade agreements uh, uh, since then. They, they're, they're, not, they're, they're minor economies compared to you know, the one we had today, and they're minor economies compared to Europe. So in terms of, uh, of the, uh, the opportunity that this creates, it's the, it's, this is the biggest free trade agreement that Canada is concluding since the one with the United States and, and, and of course, Mexico. Um, the other approach is the European approach. Euro Europeans, after the, uh, the Second World War, uh, you know, created a, a, a consensus among nations that this could never happen again, that, that, the, uh, that the wealth should be shared, that the uh, countries of Europe should not be marginalized. So there, there was a, a very much a peace dividend approach. And, and the, so in, in 1957, there was the Treaty of Rome, which is the, the first step to what is today the European Union. But it was preceded several years before by an agreement just between France and Germany for um, uh, coal supply, and, and where coal would flow uh, freely between Germany and France to make sure that, that, that uh, the energy source was, was shared uh, between the, the two countries. Um, so in 1957, there were just six founding nations of, of what is today the European Union, and now there is uh, 27, uh, or actually 28. Um, but the EU concluded free trade agreements, and, and here again, you see that they're very, they're minor economies. When you see the Palestinian Authority, the Syrians, uh, Israel, South, South Africa, it's still very much a, a, a peace dividend approach or a social development approach to free trade. There, you know, South Africa, it, it, you know, was the end of, a, of apartheid. The Palestinian Authority date turns around the creation of the Palestinian Authority. Um, and um, or, or you see it with 2012 with Iraq with the sharp change of, of regime uh, with Saddam Hussein. So you see that it's a peace, peace dividend, a social, political development 
type of, of uh, prioritization for these types of free trade agreements. Now, so um, I, I gave this talk a talk and, and, and uh, I did it a, a, a few months ago and I had this uh, a business person that said to me, why are we talking about free trade? And I said, you know, what, what's so important about Sarah? And I said, well, when did you start your company? And he says, well, I started in 1998. And where are you stuff? I was telling the United States. Well, you have never had to preoccupy yourself with tariffs because you've had free trade in the United States since the free trade agreement in 87 94. And, and so the impact of that on the economy, and this is a very telling graph, it's prepared by the United States Census Bureau with the U.S. Department of Commerce. It's in U.S. dollars. But what, what is interesting is, is the, the slope. The slope is, is pretty constant. It has dips with, you know, the, the, uh, this is the 2008 recession, but it's a pretty constant slope. It's, um, you know, uh, the uh, red line is exports from Canada, and the blue line are imports from the United States. The total is, is the, the, when you add the two together for the, 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 the amount of trade that are flowed between the, the two countries. Um, and, and what you, you, you uh, you know, it's political, but they didn't net it out of inflation, so it's constant, do it's constant dollars, but there's a natural increase due to inflation. So the inflation for this 22-year this, uh, period, cumulatively is 75%. So you kind of like take out of, of the formula, it's still an increase of $312 billion over uh, 20, uh, 22 years. That's roughly a 102% increase net of inflation. That's 5% per year of growth of trade between the two countries. And, and the net advantage there is, as you see, is, 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 is Canadian exports to the United States. Um, and so that's what free trade does. And that's what the opportunity that, that, that business people have uh, with this free trade agreement, that is coming. And that, that and the message that, that we have to say today is be prepared for it. It's from the stuff takes time. And right now we know that it will be coming to the fourth, and you should take the time that you have available to you now to prepare. So this is this is um, one of the things that, that when we did report about free trade uh, between Canada and, and Europe, they said, you know, what is the state of, 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 of our trade situation? Well, you see that Europe is our second uh, in terms of ranking and trade of goods, services, and investment. So, you know, a lot of people kind of react, well, isn't China like a big player in, in our country? And they are. Oh, but when you pool all the, all the 28 uh, countries of the European Union together, well, it makes a big, a big number, and that's how, how you get to that result. Our biggest trading partner, and I have another slide just to show that, is, our, is uh, in Europe, is uh, uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, and, and France. And it breaks up differently according to reason of the country. But here's, here's an issue, because trade should be equal. We should be selling as much as we're buying. It, it needs to kind of like level out. Because it, it's a question of, of currency fluctuation. It's a question of, um, uh, of, of the balance of trade. It's a question of, of the amount of Canadian money that's leaving, leaving the country to buy the European, European uh, product. And so here, here's the issue, and this is why they, they started negotiations. We're tense in terms of, of, of trading goods. Uh, they don't trade, uh, they don't uh, in Europe uh, follow trading services. And we're fourth in terms of investment. It's still a big number, but we're, you know, we're, we're fourth and they're second. So it, something needs, needs to be done to kind of like balance the, the situation where Canada needs to, to come up to speed. Um, and what, what's happened over the years is the Canadian position has it, it's sliding uh, in favor of India, uh, South, South Korea, and, and the uh, trade with, um, with China. So, um, who's DC trading with you? And so I, I, I've, I've taken up the, the top five uh, uh, countries. The first biggest trading partner um, is, is uh, the United Kingdom. But you see that we're still very much, uh, you know, 41, 11, 9. So 60% are, are 
raw materials, and then we get into um, a small, much smaller percentages in terms of manufacturing uh, our transformed products. So there's, there's a growth potential for uh, BC businesses into uh, into Europe uh, in in those those fields. Um, second trading partner is is the Netherlands. Still, you know, uh, another close to 60 percent. Uh, in terms of, of raw materials, you see also that there is a fluctuation. The, the European economy is, is going through a rough path, so you see that there's a, uh, a negative flow of, of goods uh, or, uh, to, to the Netherlands uh, uh, between 2013-2014. Germany, uh, in, increased trade shows that there's a robustness of, of the, uh, the, the German economy, and you get uh, also, there you, you have a, a uh, you see that they're more a consumer of manufactured goods than just raw materials. Um, Italy, there again a lot of a lot of, um, of raw raw materials and uh, a Finland. And it's interesting. I give I I, I, I give this conference across the country it, uh, and in, in Quebec. The the trading partners are um, in terms of rank are Germany, um, United Kingdom, and France, and the and and, and it's hardly any raw material. And and then you see what uh, and BC statistics do not trade what we're importing. So I can't give you that number, but but when we see what um, what uh, are, is brought into Quebec as an, as an example. Import. Uh, Germany's big ticket item are cars, uh, and uh, France's biggest ticket item are wine, beauty products. So you know you're, you're, you need to sell a uh, hell of a lot of beauty products uh, to, to match just one car in terms of, of, of uh, pricing. Funny that the, the high-end vehicles all come from all come from Germany. Um, so. You see that the manufacturing sector has this great opportunity with the, with the free trade of getting into uh, Europe uh, and and also diversifying British Columbia economy to uh, other fields than just the, the raw materials. So the thinking was that this would all be enforced by January 1st, 2015. Um, what we were told was the uh, the uh, uh, free trade agreement was signed in uh, September 2014. It would take six months to translate into the official languages of the, the EU. It would then be sent to the uh, Council of, of, of Europe for a vote. Council of Europe are heads of state of um, uh, of Europe, and 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 then it would have to be voted by the European Parliament. Canada would require uh, implementation legislation uh, by the federal government and certain provincial uh, legislatures, uh, depending on the impact, would also have to, 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 um, to put in place implementation legislation. We weren't sure, we're not sure, we still aren't sure whether member states on an individual basis need to approve this. Um, and, and one of the reasons uh, is that um, the European Commission.
they're they're giving all the signals that they, they want this to go ahead, but the concrete acts are aren't being made. So um, and and maybe they 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 knew that we'd be in a federal election here and they didn't want the free trade agreements to be part of the debate around the federal election. And so maybe they did say we'll just you know get uh, delayed as we can We don't know what that motivation is, but the translated versions have not come out. And so this is the significant part, is that we're first, we're four years ahead, the United States is coming. And the, the United States economy will have a huge impact. There'll be a growth of 120 billion euros on the EU economy. It'll have an impact of about 90 billion euros on the US economy and about 100 billion euros um, uh, on the rest of the world as, as a trickle down effect. And I'm not a specialist in, uh, in economics, but you know, logic would tell me that Canada and, and the United States have this very interconnected, hyperly interconnected uh, economy in terms of trade back and forth. So I'm saying, good chance that there's a big spike of that 100 million that's coming our way because we're part of the United States supply chain. Um, there's been some, some sticking points. Uh, but they're the same sticking points that Canada had. Uh, the geographical recognition of products, we'll talk more about that in a, in a, in a few minutes. Uh, hormone fed beef, but genetically modified uh, organisms. Uh, energy exports, these are, um, uh, are all issues that uh, are going to be on, on the table. Um, the United States, this law passed by Congress, you cannot export oil from the United States. Also, domestic consumption and, and the whole issue of the the uh, Keystone Pipeline of bringing oil to, to the Gulf is just to have another way to export Canadian oil because they can export maybe uh, oil that doesn't come from the United States. Um, so, what is also significant besides the commencement of the negotiations is fast track approval from Congress, and that happened on June 25, 2015. So, for those who are not familiar with fast track is um, in the United States. It's the Senate that has um, uh, authority to ratify a treaty. So a treaty can be signed, but as long as it's not ratified, it is not effective. Um, and and a, an absurd example is Woodrow Wilson was central to the negotiation of the 1919 uh, uh, Treaty of Versailles that put an end to World War I. Well, Wilson came back after the signed treaty and, and, and uh, 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 passed away. And so he wasn't able to push it through, through the Senate. And so the United States has never ratified the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles. In fact, uh, it was only in 1935 that they entered a peace treaty with Germany to end, end the war um, of, uh, of, of uh, 1918. Um, so what Fast Track does is the, the Senate uh, uh, and the House of Representatives gives authority to the President to the executive to negotiate a trade agreement. And when that authority is granted, the president has five years to conclude an agreement, and when he brings it to the, the Senate, the Senate has 90 days to vote. And it doesn't vote clause by clause, which is our normal prerogative, it votes yes or it votes no. And within 90 days. And between in those 90 days, they can hear all the hearings they want, they can do a clause by clause if they want, but there will not be a vote. There will only be one vote, and that vote will be yes or no. And uh, President Obama, uh, President Reagan used this for the Canada-U.S. trade agreement. President uh, Bush uh, Sr. used it for the for NAFTA. Uh, ironically, uh, George, uh, 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 President Clinton used the authority obtained by President Bush Sr. to get the uh, uh, WTO uh, treaty approved. And, um, uh, and and the authority lapsed, and Obama just got it again. Essentially, his first priority is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which uh, was supposed to be signed um, early August, and is right now still, still working for consensus. Uh, but this is a significant move because that means that if, if they do get a treaty uh, with, the, with Europe within the next five years, ratification by the United States can be done very quickly. So, if there's like you know one slide that kind of like uh, summarizes what's happening is is this one. 
it, it um, has a higher uh, a higher overview. In trade of goods, 98% of uh, trade tariffs will go to zero. So for those of you who trade in the United States, can't like, you know, not necessarily skin to what is the impact of some of these tariffs uh, in, in protected industries. And one that is very protected is agro food. Agro food is, is worldwide because uh, it, um, every country want to protect their products. And, and that the result has been in uh, uh, tariffs that are just in, incredibly high. Um, some of them look at 45 percent. You realize that, that there, there's a huge impact of, of bringing tariffs down to, 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 to zero. Um, I was look, I was looking at the and this is to the CDC, uh, the free trade agreement that was put in place uh, with uh, South Korea had a tariff on soya, um, uh, soy um, at um, 458 percent. Phenomenal um, um, numbers, and that's because Essentially, that they don't want people from outside to really sell soy inside, uh, in, in, uh, soy inside their, uh, their, their, their country. So, 98%, 98 percent, 98 point uh, by Europe, 98 point four by Canadians. Everything else that like the remaining two percent is going to be uh, over a maximum of seven years. What's important are what are called the rules of origin. We'll get back to that in, 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 in a later slide. But rules of origin. For a manufacturer, basically say, is this a product that's originating in Canada? Or is it a product originating in Europe in which they it benefits from uh, uh, free access to, to uh, free, uh, tariff free access to, to that marketplace? And to give you an example, kind of, kind of visualize it. Um, let's say you make an, uh, you manufacture an, uh, an electronic component out of you know, a box with uh, plug into the wall and uh, it, it has a, uh, an electronic capacity. Well, you've got to look at what are the components that have made up your box because, and where do they come from? So just because you're doing it in, in, in uh, assembling your box in Missouri, well, maybe all the pieces that are in your box come from, um, uh, from Vietnam, in which case there may not be enough Canadian content to qualify the product as Canadian and meaning that it doesn't get into the, um, the European market tariff free. And, and the inverse is true too. The, the, the products that will have to enter Canada will have to, uh, the Europeans will have to show that they are in fact European products and not just a European assembled product. Um, trade and service is, is interesting because that means that, that we're, we're regulated on the most favored nation basis. That means that you cannot discriminate in terms of our trade and services based on our. Um, where we come from, uh, and, and this is uh, reciprocal. Uh, and then there's trade and investment, and what, what is significant for European-based investors is that the threshold under investment in Canada is not 1.5 billion. Uh, the threshold for not, uh, and, and so in the United States would be 1.5 billion before you have to get investment in Canada approval for a, a purchase of a, of a business. Um, uh, and the, 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 it changes every year. I think it's at three, almost 360 million otherwise uh, in terms of uh, general jurisdiction. So this, this is a, a major uh, uh, facilitator of, for the acquisition of Canadian businesses uh, by, by Europeans. So it's a bit more technical uh, where, where you kind of like see a breakdown of where the, uh, the zero tariff. Industrial goods, 99.3. So you see that for industrial goods, it's going to be you know, pretty much free trade. Um, fish and seafood, not, um, 95 percent. There's still some protection. Automobiles, there's a transition period between three and a half to seven years. Forestry products, forestry for British Columbia, 100 percent uh, tariff free at the beginning. Agricultural, 93, 92. You see that there's still protecting the agro food sector both, and, and, and as much as as we are in Canada, as much as the Europeans are on their side of the Atlantic. There will still be quota limits in beef, uh, veal, bison, and pork, um, and there are, will also be uh, a quota limits in terms of entry into Canada for, for cheese. Okay, so I, um, we, we talked about trading goods, we talked about um, what makes up a, Europe, uh, a Canadian product. Um, in terms of the rule of origin. 
Um, and so what they've done is they've uh, um, they said, well, certain sectors, it's, it's difficult in terms of a transition to say whether they're Canadian or not. The automobile sector is a fine example because we're, uh, there'll be a free trade agreement between Canada and the EU. There is one at this point in the United States. And our automobile sector has parts going you know, north and south um, to, to the border, and that's why in 1965 they put in the auto pack to basically put that at zero tariff just in the automobile sector, uh, which is one of the exceptions to the Canadian position of being a very protectionist uh, ju jurisdiction. Um, and so they said 100,000 automobiles can be sold to the EU, and we will apply more liberal um, interpretation of the, um, the the rules of origin, recognizing the but uh, the, uh, uh, the complexity of, of that in industry. And then then we have like these things that you kind of like wonder: um, thirty thousand high, uh, high sugar products, ten thousand tons of chocolate confectionery, thirty-five thousand tons of processors, and the one I like the most is sixty thousand tons of uh, dog and cat food. So I think that like six container boats is full of dog and cat food. Phenomenal. I mean, someone's got an influence here. I don't know what, but someone's got an influence here. Um, so other sectorial things that, that, that address you know, regional issues. Europeans have been wanting to dock their boats in, in, in Newfoundland since forever, and, you, and, and Newfoundland uh, government and fishermen have always kind of like blocked that so that they will have access on a most, most favored nation, meaning you cannot discriminate uh, in terms of fees and, and services that are offered when a European boat will dock in St. John. Um, in Ontario, there's a special tax on European wine, and, um, so that has to be eliminated. But what's important for ca Canadians and this, we saw the whole debate when the, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership was being um, uh, discussed is that our su supply management and the agro foods and dairy uh, will, will be maintained. It, it artificially jacks, jacks our prices, but it creates that we, that we have a vibrant uh, agricultural sector. Um, we won't debate whether it's good or bad. It's just there, and, and um, the... Um, it, it's not changing the status quo in terms of the way things are done in, in our uh, agriculture and dairy um, sectors. Trade, trade and goods. When you're in trade and goods, there's, there's uh, and well, the phone's being made, so I can't really show that sure account, but any outside plot you have, you flip on the back, it's got like initials, like an alphabet suit. It's got CSA, the Canadian um, <coughs> Standards Association. Basically, saying it's certified to be sold in Canada. That ULC on the back which means it's certified to be uh, sold in um, uh, in the United States. And it's got uh, UE uh, on the back, uh, means it's certified to be sold in, in Europe. And right now, that manufacturer, well, for Canada, I think you only have one door to knock on because we're, we're, we've harmonized our standards. But you have to, uh, once you've certified your product for Canada, you've got to go knock on the door in Europe to get your product certified for their market. Well, what this will bring is that your uh, the CSA is going to be authorized to uh, uh, certify your product for both the United States and Europe. So it's going to be one shop shopping. It's going to be easier. So instead of having to deal with with some guy in Brussels who's looking at your stuff and uh, time zones and stuff like that, you're going to be dealing with one person, uh, one entity here in Canada. And that's the manufacturer that's going to be uh, very, very key. Similarly, and, and, and uh, for, for those who are joining us uh, in, in Europe, similarly, um, the uh, European uh, uh, standard uh, organization <coughs> will be able to certify the product for the Canadian market. Canadian market. So they too will only have one shop, uh, uh, one stop shopping. And and then so on on, on the standard harmonization. So there's there's um, the There'll be uh, cooperation in further regulatory development. Technical uh, uh, regulations will still look to, to, to uh, level the playing field. There's going to be joint recognition of test results. And that, that was like a major impediment. Mm -hmm. Because you would go, you know, some products need to be tested. And so if you had them tested here, fine. 
then you have to hold, start the frozen back again. So your time to market would just be pushed out, and now you're going to have a one again, one one single platform. Um, biotechnology approval uh, process is supposed to be refined, and there's going to be uh, cooperation on sanitary and phytosanitary uh, issues. Um, so trade, I've been interested in, in trade like forever, and when I kind of like, started doing this, and we all talk about trade services, but I can't like put my finger. What are trade and service things? And so this is, uh, so I, I kind of like dug up <laughs> transportation services, travel, communication. We've got someone from Japan Airlines here, here, here today. I mean, they are they're going to be interested in trade, trade and service. Um, construction, insurance, uh, financial, they're, they're all there. What's interesting is royalties and licensing fees are, are considered uh, as trade and services, and, uh, and those are always um, uh, important for technological transfers. Um, and the uh, uh, cultural and recreation. Now, we've got certain things that, that, uh, that are off the table. So healthcare, public education, social services. We have programs that, for the preference treat treatment of Aboriginal people and minorities, and, and cultural industries are not covered by this, this agreement. Um, but everything's going to be regulated on the most favored nation basis. Now, I don't know if I explained what that concept is, but it means that if, if they uh, do an, uh, create an advantage for the United States in their negotiations in the terms of trade, trade and services, we will benefit from it automatically. When I spoke earlier about Investment Canada reducing or increasing the threshold to 1.5 billion, those countries with whom we have most favored nation clauses uh, will benefit from that too, i.e. the United States, Mexico, uh, South, South Korea. So they will all pop up to, to <coughs> that, that level. Um, provincial and uh, territorial um, our, our, um, regulatory schemes will be maintained, but when they change the regulatory schemes uh, or modify them, they will have to take into consideration the, um, uh, the, the uh, obligations by virtue of the FTA. Um, and, and what's also important, and Bruce and I are both lawyers, is there's going to be a, a mutual recognition of professional qualifications. Um, the province of Quebec is, is, has already had, um, a scheme in place with the, the, uh, the government of France on, on that basis, and, and it gives us an idea of how that would work um, for, for the rest of the country and the rest of the European uh, nation. Um, I can become uh, a member of the, uh, the, the Bar of Paris or any of the, their bar associations are in my city. I can become a member of the, the Paris Bar um, by doing uh, an exam, uh, uh, basically a limited, uh, in limited in scope, and I'm, I'm then uh, qualified to uh, plead for court in, uh, in Paris. Um, there, there's, there's always the code of ethics, you're not supposed to do something if you don't know what you're doing. So that doesn't mean all of a sudden I'm going to do this criminal law out of, out of, out of Paris, but I've got a bit of a learning curve to figure out how it works. Um, and, and that kind of brings us to, to where Bruce is going to, I think, take over for a bit on the temporary entry rules, because um, this, this, is all, this is both, uh, uh, well, this is actually a huge opportunity for, for both Europeans and Canadian businesses. And I'll, um, I'll let Bruce. Uh, um, Katie's going to oh, okay. do it for me. Thanks, DJ. All right. All right. So uh, this is this issue of temporary entry uh, of, for business persons is uh, the focus of it is Chapter 12. Um, and uh, unlike DJ giving a broad overview, we're going to focus in on Chapter 12 and 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 take a clear a good look at at what this involves and. I do have a couple of preliminary comments which aren't on the um, on the slide, and they are uh, Chapter 12 is rather convoluted when you read it. It takes you back and forth in, in, the, in the document when you're looking for different things, and so what I've tried to do is make it more linear and straightforward in the limited amount of time that we have to look at this. But before you consider, uh, assuming implementation, before you consider bringing personnel into Canada, and this clearly does have a Canadian slant to it, uh, uh, as opposed to an intra-European slant, because as you'll see, that's a, it's become very complicated 
uh, in terms of the schedules and annexes to this agreement, which deal with the type of temporary entry country by country. So, um, as I said, I've tried to provide a, a linear outline. It is an outline. Uh, it is not detailed. Uh, it will be m beneficial that once this is implemented and it is actually placed in practice, we will have a better chance to revisit this and uh, determine how labor mobility will really work, not in theory, but in practice. So I would expect that when we do implement this agreement, the Canadian government will, in, amongst its uh, publications under the uh, what are called operational manuals, a lot of them have been uh, converted onto the internet for public consumption, they will specify specifically how we're going to deal with these various categories. Um, so what we're going to do here is examine each category of natural persons seeking entry as business persons, and then we're going to look at how these uh, uh, defined terms are uh, interplay with the actual rules, and then we're going to look at, finally, at what's called an economic needs test. Not an economic means test, but a needs test, which is not defined in this particular document, and for that matter, it's not even defined in the world uh, the WTO uh, document either. It's 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 a general concept, and but I'll tell you how it applies in this situation. So, Article Two, each Article Two of Chapter Twelve, each party shall allow temporary entry to natural persons for business purposes of the other party, in accordance with this chapter, and who can comply with its immigration measures applicable to temporary entry. So what does that mean? Well, from a Canadian perspective, it means that Canadian immigration uh, measures remain paramount. So passport requirements, health requirements, security and criminal requirements, uh, and visa restrictions are not impaired by this agreement. So for example, if you have an impaired driving conviction in another jurisdiction, you may qualify for the various permits or exemptions from work permits, but if you have an impaired driving conviction in another jurisdiction, it, it equates to an offense under the Canadian Criminal Code, and you are barred from entering Canada for five years uh, uh, after termination of sentence imposed, unless you get a special permit to get into this country. So those general provisions in our Act mm -hmm. aren't going anywhere. Now, Chapter 12, as Didier mentioned, it applies to uh, a, a series of, of, of identifiable uh, personnel. The first is called key personnel. The second is called contractual service suppliers. The third is called independent professionals. And the fourth is called short-term business visitors. Now, it does parallel the North American Free Trade Agreement, but the North American Free Trade Agreement um, effectively allows U U.S. nationals and Mexican nationals to enter Canada as business visitors without a work permit, as intercompany transferees with a work permit, as one of 63 professionals under the NAFTA agreement with a work permit, and as what are called treaty traders or investors. So there are a lot of parallels, but in general terms, uh, I found in looking at this uh, particular chapter that the definitions are broader and are more inclusive. But as I say, we will see how this plays out in actual practice when they implement this agreement. And next slide, please, please. So in terms of key personnel, it's, it's divided into a series of subcategories. So business visitors for investment purposes are natural persons working in a managerial or specialist position uh, responsible for setting up an enterprise. And an enterprise is defined in this agreement as a corporation, trust, partnership, sole proprietorship, or joint venture. Another subcategory is investors, natural persons who establish, develop, or administer the operation of an investment in a supervisory or executive capacity and to which that person has committed or the enterprise employing the person has committed or is in the process uh, uh, of committing a substantial amount of capital. It's quite a mouthful, but bottom line is um, what it doesn't say there is what a substantial amount of capital is. And that does parallel the treaty investor category in NAFTA, which does not require uh, a minimum amount. And so that minimum amount is what is subject to, under NAFTA, is subject to what's called the proportionality test. So if you're bringing in 
and uh, setting up an architectural office and you're going to employ uh, two architects, then your uh, capital outlay is going to be a lot, lot smaller than if you were uh, uh, building um, a, um, a concrete plant, for example, so, or some form of manufacturing entity. So a visa office would look at the amount of capital you're bringing in, and if it's proportional to what you propose you're going to do, um, uh, that will be acceptable. And that's how I believe this will be implemented, because there, as I say, there are a lot of parallels uh, to the NAFTA agreement. Next slide, please. Intercorporate transferees. Uh, just let me say that under NAFTA and under the Canadian G General Immigration Regulations, there are provisions for providing uh, or for bringing in intracompany transferees. And in general terms, intracompany transferees, uh, uh, before we come to this particular um, group of transferees, under NAFTA and under the general rules, you can bring, if you have a, uh, uh, an existing entity or a new entity, you can transfer in a senior executive, a senior manager, or a person with specialized knowledge uh, who, who have worked for your company for at least one of the past three years. And you can do that without uh, a great deal of difficulty, with one minor exception, which I'll bring back, uh, come back to later. And this is just another version of that agreement that is, uh, or of that concept which is still in place in Canada. So intracorporate transferees, as they call it, are employed by an enterprise of one party for one year, or have been partners in an enterprise for one year temporarily, and are, uh, pardon me, in, have been partners in an enterprise for one year and temporarily transferred to a subsidiary branch or parent in the territory of another. The person concerned must belong to one of the following categories. Senior personnel directing the management of the enterprise, specialists, which are individuals who possess uncommon knowledge of enterprise products uh, or an advanced level of expertise, or knowledge of the enterprise's production, research, equipment, techniques, or management. And one thing I will say about this specialized knowledge um, category, and again, I'm speculating, but since June of 2014, the Canadian government has uh, increased the, uh, uh, or have applied a more rigorous definition of what constitutes specialized knowledge. And so, where it used to be uh, very easy to bring in personnel who were not executives, who were not senior managers, but were personnel with a specialized knowledge in a specific area. It used to be a, a relatively easy thing to do. It's no longer the case. They're getting drilled at the ports of entry when they apply. And it is at the ports of entry because uh, U.S. nationals under NASA may apply at a port of entry for these types of documents. Um, Here's something that is not in the NAFTA agreement. Graduate trainees, which means that you have a degree and you are being temporarily transferred from uh, one party to another for training purposes. Okay? Next slide, please. Another uh, area uh, or uh, concept that is being developed here is contractual service suppliers. And they are defined as individuals employed by an enterprise in one party with no entity operating in, the, uh, in the, another party. And the enterprise concludes a contract to supply services to a consumer in another party, and its employees are required to fulfill contractual obligations. Well, it only applies to contracts of 12 months duration. If you, if you run a contract outside of 12 months, none of these rules apply. The employee must have performed the services for the enterprise for at least one year prior to entry, uh, which is not unlike the NAFTA agreement and our general immigration regulations, and have three years of professional experience in the sector, which is the subject of the contract. And uh, we'll come back to sectors because they're listed in the agreement, in, enumerated in detail. Uh, the employee who is assigned to the task must possess a university degree or equivalent qualification and professional qualifications where required by the laws of the party where the service is supplied. I'll give a better example with, if, if we go to the next slide, Katie. Independent professionals. Again, you're dealing with service contracts of 12 months only, 
It applies to natural per persons engaged in the supply of services who are self-employed, and they've concluded a service contract with a consumer in another party. They are required by the consumer in uh, another party to perform services. These people must have six years professional service in the sector of activity uh, and must possess a university degree or qualification demonstrating knowledge of an equivalent level and professional qualifications to perform the activity in the other party as required. That's a, a good example of that would be um, a lawyer based in Paris. He has a, uh, uh, they have no uh, uh, office here in Vancouver. He flies in to uh, uh, meet and, and remain in Canada for a period of time to address uh, one of uh, their Canadian clients' concerns. Um, he will not only have to uh, meet these criteria that are listed here, but specifically he'll have to make sure that he is permitted to practice here under the Law Society rules of British Columbia. That's what I take from that professional qualification. Now, that, that does <coughs> happen uh, already, but this has been formalized in this agreement and will apply to European nationals coming forward. Uh, next slide, please. Short-term business visitors. This, uh, again, does parallel NAFTA uh, very closely. Short-term entry allowed to carry out activities in Appendix D. No remuneration from a source in the party where staying temporarily. Must not engage in sales to the general public. May not engage in the supply of a service within the framework of a contract between an enterprise with no commercial presence on the territory where the consumer resides. So, except as set out in Appendix D. So, what does Appendix D permit you to do? The next slide tells you. Meetings and consultation, research and design, marketing research, training seminars, trade fairs, exhibitions, sales, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, purchasing. Um, again, this very closely parallels the uh, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. And the key point from dealing with these matters on a, on a daily basis in terms of U.S. personnel coming up here. U.S. personnel may come up here without a work permit to sell, sell American products under NASA. But, but what they want to make sure uh, is that they can um, verify that they will not be paid by a Canadian source. And that, they will, and that the profits from any sales they make will revert to their source country. So basically, they've got to be on a U.S. payroll. They've got to be representing a U.S. company, and uh, they will be returning to the United States, and the profits from their sale will revert to the United States. And essentially, this is what this agreement is saying about the Canada-European relationship. It will be set up the same way. Uh, next slide, please. All right. As I told you before, if you actually read this document or read the, the chapter 12, you have to flip back and forth to kind of find out uh, because uh, various concepts are interspersed throughout the, the passage. So what I tried to do is summarize lengths of stay by category. So the intercorporate transferees or what we know in North America as the intercompany transferees, the lesser of three years of, or the length of the intercorporate transferee as a contract with a possible extension of up to 18 months if either a specialist or senior personnel. For graduate trainees, the lesser of one year or the length of the contract. Investors, one year. Business visitors, 90 days with any, within any six-month period. The contractual service suppliers and independent professionals, cumulative periods of not more than 12 months with extensions possible in any 24-month period or for any duration of contract. Short-term business visitors, 90 days maximum in a six-month period. So you're, you're going to know that because if these European uh, nationals come into Canada, and as I say, we're doing this from a, a Canadian perspective, but if they're going to be documented, they're going to be limited on their documents specifically to the lengths of stay laid out in uh, this agreement. All right, next uh, one, Katie. Now, when you look through this chapter, it also 
uh, at first glance is confusing as to who requires a work permit and who does not. So, and I'm speaking again from the Canadian perspective, but we're bringing in European nationals to work for a company. So, but it's broken down by uh, subcategory. So under the category of key personnel, the subcategory of business visitors for investment purposes is specifically exempt from obtaining a work permit. And that makes a lot of sense to me because as, as we structured under NAFTA, business visitors do come in without a work permit as long as they meet those qualifications of, for example, uh, being employed in another country, being paid in another country, and their activities will result in profits being reverted to that other country. Short-term business visitors uh, are, um, are exempt from the uh, work permit as well. These, term, these uh, exemptions are specifically laid out in the document. And while each party shall allow the employment of intracorporate transferees and investors, there is no specific exemption from work permit requirements except as we qualify here. The key personnel provisions are subject to a list of reservations and exceptions in Appendix B. So if you go to Appendix B, so, so j just before I move on there, just to make it clear, there's, if, I, I think the best way to look at it is this. If the agreement doesn't specify that a work permit is, that, that, uh, that a, an individual in a category is not exempt, you assume they need a permit. So under Appendix B, which does qualify these comments, Appendix B is in the back of this document, and it consists of specific reservations and exceptions for key personnel and short-term business visitors by country. These restrictions are applied, if you look in the back of the document, you'll see that these restrictions are applied by European signatories only on a country by country basis, but none of those restrictions identified have been implemented by Canada. So uh, to give you an, it's an example, if we want to send a Canadian national um, under the investor category to the Czech Republic, the Czech Republic requires both a work permit and an economic needs test. And just hold the thought on the economic needs test. We'll come back to that. Denmark requires a short-term business visitor to obtain a work permit and an economic needs test. All right, next category. Contractual services suppliers and independent professionals. All right, Annex Roman numeral one applies to these categories of, of, of workers. And, and although each party will allow entry and stay of these two specific classifications, that is contractual service suppliers and independent professionals, uh, it is in accordance with ec and Annex 1, which lists reservations by economic sector. So Annex 1 lists sectors of an economy uh, that are applicable to the contractual service supplier. There's a separate list for independent professionals. Uh, Example, or examples of sectors that apply to contractual service suppliers include legal, accounting, and engineering services. All right, now if you go to the next slide, please. There are 37 sectors, uh, uh, economic sectors listed for contractual service suppliers. The sectors applicable to independent professionals include uh, management consulting, mining, and telecommunication, and they're all specifically enumerated, and there are 18 sectors listed. The list applies to European signatories. All right. For Canada, sectoral commitments apply to occupations listed under skill levels 0 and A. So I, some of you who I do know may know this, some may not, but we have uh, the, the Canadian government and the, through the Service Canada has developed what's called a National Occupation Matrix. And it basically categorizes every occupation that you can think of. And they're categorized by le skill levels 0, A, B, C, and D. Skill level 0 are management, manage, uh, management occupations. A are professional occupations, which basically require a minimum of a degree. Skill level B is uh, post-secondary education for a trade. 
C and D are non-post-secondary educated uh, personnel in, in general. And so what uh, Canada has done under this agreement is that these reservations are uh, applicable to management positions and to professional positions. Next category, please. Or next slide, please. So I'll give you an example. A Canadian, a Canadian national seeks to perform accounting services in Denmark. He'll probably need a work permit, but he won't need to go undergo an economic needs test. Similarly, a French national seeking entry to Canada to perform accounting services. No economic needs test. But what I'm telling you is employers need to look at Annex 1 on a case-by-case -case basis because it is literally broken down country by country by country. Because not every country has agreed to all of these terms. All right? They, they are guarding how foreign workers from other European nations and from Canada, for that matter, are going to be admitted. Right? So if we go to the next slide. Um, well, I, I, just before we go to the next slide, I did want to make one point. You'll see the term in the annex, unbound. Uh, not bound, which means effectively they're not, uh, a signatory is not bound by this term of the agreement. And so uh, I, I came up with an example. So, for example, you have taxation services being offered by a Finnish a tax expert, expert who's seeking entry into another European country or into Canada. Both the European Union and Canada are listed as unbound by this term. So effectively, they're not going to uh, agree to uh, the guidelines in Chapter 12, and they're going to preserve their own regulatory commitments to, uh, uh, to tax experts. I don't know why this has been singled out, but as I say, you've got to look at the sector, you've got to look at the country, and you have to see how they are restricting entry. Now, I'm going to go to the economic needs test. As I said, it's not a means test, it's a needs test. And uh, it's not a term that is defined, um, but in Canada, uh, this is synonymous with what we now call labor market impact assessment and what used to be called labor market opinion. Uh, economic needs tests in general limit the number of service suppliers or natural persons to perform work. They are also limit other uh, aspects of international trade agreements as well, but for our purposes I've just simplified it to service suppliers and natural persons performing work. So from a Canadian perspective, it's the process whereby an employer must demonstrate there are no qualified Canadians, or for that matter qualified permanent residents, to take the employment position offered to them. This process is time consuming and costly because the employer, not the employee, the employer applies to Employment and Social Development Canada, formerly Service Canada, uh, after a 30 day period of advertising. There are some exceptions uh, for 14 days depending on the sector of the economy, but for the most part it's 30 days of advertising. Next slide please. And there are significant delays in processing uh, these applications. You can wait. Uh, we had one uh, client wait five months to bring in a Hungarian national to, uh, as an IT specialist. Five months he sat and waited and, uh, to get uh, the labor certification or economic, I, I call it labor certification. It's, it's the same process because what they, what uh, the uh, ESD, uh, ES, what is it? ESDC personnel will do is they will make you <coughs> retain all the, all of the resumes. They will call you and ask you why a specific individual in those resumes isn't qualified for the job. They will ensure that you are paying at a wage that is comparable with their version of what is a. Uh, uh, a fair wage according to StatCan uh, statistics, which may not be comparable with the structure, the salary structure in your firm, and in general will make the process time consuming, costly, and rather painful. Um, it's not a viable process unless the employee is paid in the top 10% of wage earners in the province. 
there, in fact, is a 10-day processing window. But I've been told it's now, this isn't in the, this was all revised in July of 2014. And at that time, it did not say that that 10-day window was subject to the uh, discretion of the officer dealing with the file. Uh, we've got them through on 10 days. And what, what that means in the province of British Columbia is that you're paying someone over $80,000 a year at this time. So if you get through that process, then the work permit follows. But the significant part of Chapter 12 is that it does get or eliminate, in many instances, this labor certification process or economic uh, needs test. So that is a significant benefit for bringing people in. Because otherwise, uh, I mean, there is clearly right now uh, a objection at a federal level to the importation of temporary foreign workers on a large basis because of a lot of criticism they have received. Fortunately, there are certain sectors of our economy that need these foreign workers. All right, if we go to the next slide, and last slide, I just wanted to point out that to, to, to remember that the CETA agreement does not prevent Canada from implementing visa restrictions on nationals of any country that is a signatory. And that is um, uh, similarly with NAFTA, while U.S. nationals don't need a visa to get into Canada, Mexican nationals do. And a visa, for, from a Canadian perspective, is a, uh, a, uh, a mark that is scanned into the body of the passport, whereas a permit is an actual physical document that is stapled into the passport and removed when it's expired. You can't get a visa to port of entry. You must go through our diplomatic post abroad to get a visa. And if you apply, if you approach a port of entry without a visa, you are inadmissible. Um, the other point, summary point I wanted to make is that CETA does not have any impact on Canadian rules for the acquisition of permanent residence or citizenship. This deals with temporary entry only. I'm going to turn it back to you, Dave. Thanks. Um, and and uh, two points on mobility, like one, for, for us Canadians, we've been dealing with the rapid growth for uh, 25 years with NAFTA. We're, we're very much attuned to what that reality is in terms of work permits and, and temporary uh, presence uh, business services in the uh, space. But for, for Europeans, this is, this is going to be like a whole new ball There, uh, when the, the mass treaty was put in place, everyone who was a citizen of a European country became a citizen of Europe with full mobility. But um, as, as Richard was saying, I was born in Lyon, France. I have both passports. I can go live anywhere in Europe more more than that. And there are no, uh, no restrictions at all in terms of my ability to do that. Uh, and I don't have to ask anyone's permission. I can go set up shop in terms of living as, 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 as I see. But it will not be that reality, that, uh, that mobility. Uh, of Europeans coming into Canada, all these rules are in place. And it will be also for Canadians going into Europe. And uh, Bruce and I wrote an article, which you'll find it in, in your folder, uh, uh, on, on this. You know, if you do kind of like a table of how complex it is, there's, there's 20, 28 countries in Europe. There's, I think, uh, I'm going to get my numbers on, but I think there's like eight types of business travelers, and there's 11 types of business activities. So, Add it up, and that's all the types of, of possibilities that, that, that exist in terms of, of, uh, of a temporary entry necessity or not to have a work permit, whether you need to or not to have um, a, uh, an economic need test, which is undefined. That means each country will apply it differently. Uh, and, and one of the examples, and this is like, so where you need to, you know, my, one of the messages of, of today's conference is be prepared, be prepared in advance. And be a sophisticated business traveler, check before you go, so you don't want to suffer the into the process. So one of the examples in the article is about Austria. You go to a trade fair in Austria and you stay more than seven days in Austria and you need a work permit. And you need to do an economic needs test. Because Austria is the market that you want to, to develop for, for your widget, um, 
and you're spend more than 30 days cumulatively in a calendar year in Austria, there again you need, you need to work there. And even if each time you were there, you were there for like only five days. So that is one sector, just sec uh, and uh, and and for the just for trade fairs. But you have to imagine in the 11 types of business activities, it, it, it's a, a huge grid that you need to kind of like pinpoint what you're doing, how long you're going to be there, whether you need to have something done in advance. It's very difficult. The events for the Europeans, they only have to deal with Canada and about 28, 28 countries, and, and, and so it, um, because it's obviously done on, on the federal level. Um, Trade and investment. Um, so uh, we already spoke about uh, uh, the investment being uh, uh, increased to 1.5 billion. Uh, and so there's a couple things that kind of like uh, uh, that, that came up from you know recent experiences of, of the Canadian government. So Canada has uh, the, the treaty recognizes government rights to regulate and the sovereign control of development of natural resources. This needs to put when uh, the Chinese wanted to buy a, a chunk of the, of the power plant. And um, uh, there was like a, a ruling from investment in Canada limiting the scope of that that undertaking. Um, and then there's weird things, which you know, which is treaty gobbledygook. Prudential exemptions protect reasonable measures taken for prudential reasons. Being so like, this is circular. What does this mean? I I copied it literally. But what it is, I think, is things like the Bank Act in Canada, which require liquidity requirements for our banks, and which basically was the reason why when all banks were failing in 2008, ours kind of like weathered the storm uh, pretty much unharmed. And these are taken for, for uh, because they, all our Canadian banks have high liquidity ratios compared to foreign banks in other jurisdictions. And the investor state dispute settlement mechanism and is, is something that's in there, and this is being, this is being contested or discuss and, and let me give you a bit of background to that because it, it, it's very interesting. I was interviewed by a, mag a European magazine on this and it was, well, it, because essentially it's an arbitration process. You know, have an arbitration because uh, there's been a change in legislation and you're taking away like this. Well, arbitration is a secret, it's not very democratic. You know that there's no democratic naming of the, um, of the arbitrators. I'm like, hold on, I'm more than a lawyer now for, for uh, uh, 25 years. Um, it's when it's the nomination of a judge, a democratic process. We're not we're, 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 we're not in Texas having an election for for, for, for judges. In, in Canada, we don't we don't know this. And in Europe, there are no elections for judges. So it's not a democratic process to begin with. Where that people have kind of like been a bit alarmed is basically and it, it starts in Japan, ironically, with an earthquake, a tsunami, and the destruction of the uh, Fukushima. Um, uh, nuclear reactor. And the reaction is worldwide, so we see it here on our coast. But in Germany, the decision is made we are getting out of nuclear energy. Finished. We're going to have other means, but it won't be nuclear. And so what you have is you have all these nuclear facilities in Germany that are now uh, subject to a form of expropriation, but the government's not taking them. They're just, shut, they're just shutting them down. They're taking away their, their, their current. So you have this company out of of um, Sweden, who basically sued the German government for 5.4 billion, 5 .4 billion euros <coughs> on a similar investor state to three settlement process. And so the Germans are kind of like a bit, you know, a bit fussed about this. And one of the points that, that, that they brought out was that one of the points they brought out was, well, we would rather you go before our national court. Well, we don't follow your national court, except that you have a whole bunch of new countries that have become part of the European Union that do not have a very long tradition of independent uh, judiciary, transparent uh, 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 process, and um, uh, we feel that if our interpreters have to go before your national court because you had a change in legislation, that they don't have a snowball again. And so, the result is that it's in, it's in the treaty. They're not, they're not really happy about it, but all free trade agreements have been concluded by Canada uh, since the, 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 obviously the first one, uh, which is the NAFTA deal, or the uh, U.S. deal, have these types of provisions in them. We've got about 10 minutes. I'm going to start moving a bit, a bit faster just to tell 
cover up. Government procurement, three, uh, three things. One, the threshold that you find in the, um, uh, in your, on your left-hand column are not different from the WCO obligation. When we did the NAFTA deal, we, we lowered our threshold to $25,000. They were not lowered. What is interesting, however, is the types of entities that are now subject to these rules have been widened. So there are opportunities for <coughs> and for Europeans to be bidding uh, on, on municipalities, school boards, hospitals, federal um, uh, uh, and provincial crown corporations, uh, which is a, a wider uh, basket of entities that are subject to public procurement rules. Um, what is interesting is that within five years, there's going to be an electronic access platform. Those who are bidding in Canada already have this. If you're uh, a, a, a supplier of goods here in BC and you want to bid on a contract in Ontario, there's one, there's one stop shopping because the municipality of uh, Waterloo has to post their um, procurement on that website. Well, that will exist for your. You're going to be able to have someone in your uh, business here in BC monitoring the situation in, in Europe and basically being able to qualify yourself to bid. And these are great ways to enter a market because it's the first time in. And if you qualify better price and you're, well, you're competing perhaps against an American who's still paying that tariff and you're going tariff three, well, you know, either you're putting more money in your pocket or you're having a better price to, to, to undercut your competitors. You know, that, that's what the, the, a free trade agreement brings to to Canadians and, and vice versa for, for Europeans. So that's, that's a real, real plus and something that people will have to keep their eye out for when it, when it comes into play. Um, okay, pharmaceuticals, uh, less, uh, intellectual property, pharmaceuticals, there's, there's a couple things that patent protection is going to be extended. It's a trade-off on, on pharmaceuticals. Either you, you extend the patent protection to what it is in every other kind of, uh, major industrialized country and, and it recognizes the lead time and investment they have to put in to develop a, 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 new, um, a new vaccine or a new uh, drug. Or you keep the Canadian regime which, lets, um, uh, um, uh, which doesn't recognize the market, uh, market uh, the lead time to market and let generic ma manufacturers copy your patent much faster than in other, other jurisdictions. So you know, either you promote research and development or you lower your health costs in really a difficult one to, to settle, but that's what happened. What, what's happened was, is, and it's, we, we have an article, um, uh, we have an article about this. They recognize another 179 um, uh, uh, terms covering food and beer. Uh, there was already a deal on EU wines. That's why you can't buy champagne from California, because uh, it's the thing that will be called a, uh, a white sparkling wine. Uh, it's it sold here in D.C., whereas if it's sold the same bottle, it's sold with blame, we call it champagne. Um, so 179 uh, additional products are being covered up. We have an article uh, about that that you can have uh, more information about certain things, uh, an English and French translation of, of protected areas, uh, like Black Forest Ham versus uh, Schwanwald or Schlinken, which is the German name for Black Forest Ham, have, have also its exemptions. But if you're in the agro-food business, you need to be aware of the, the types of names that you can and cannot use. And the, the reference date is um, October um, 13, 2013, which is the date of the uh, agreement in principle between Canada and Europe. Things can like revolve around that. So if you were already using one of these 179 names before then, you're, you're, you're still good to go. State-to-state uh, dispute settlement mechanism, which is uh, mediation. Uh, it's a shorter process than one in the WCO. It has had atrocious, atrocious delays. Um, Three-person per panels, and what you have is they've already prepared specialized rosters. Investors, the state dispute settlement we've spoken about. And then procurement, well, uh, usually there's, uh, uh, in, in, in the NAFTA deal, we had an uh, identification that National Trade Tribunal would be the one to deal with procurement litigation. That hasn't been identified at this at this point. Okay, this is what I really wanted to get to for the last five minutes. Um, it's some practical advice. First of all, from a Canadian perspective, we've got a huge experience base that you kind of need. You've probably taken for granted because you've been doing it for the last 30.
30 years with, with the United States. This, this trade being similar to that which we have in it with the United States. And so that experience that you have trading north south is that you're going to be able to, to, to trade uh, going uh, uh, east to, to Europe. And, and so you, you need kind of like uh, a lot of things that you take for granted when you export goods, you're going to be able to continue to, to apply with obviously some modifications. Realize, of course, you will have to comply with local laws. You need to be assumed that if you're going into uh, Europe, that you're going to have to be concerned with, with European laws. Mobility rights, well, um, regular business travelers will at one point need a, a, a visa for work permit. Tax, a tax consideration. Each country has a, probably a tax treaty with Canada. So you need to structure yourself looking at the country you want to go in. You need to look at what uh, is the tax situation for a corporation. Easy example to give you. If you, uh, you decide, my point of entry, I'm going to set up a subsidiary in France. And, uh, my, and that will be my point of entry in, into Europe. Central with uh, uh, um, a shipping, good court, uh, uh, airline a connection. Well, know that in France, the corporate taxation rate is 33%. And when you want to export your dividends, at one point, you want to take your money and bring it back here, which is where, where you're doing business, it's, there's a, a, a 5% uh, tax rate on the dividend. So we're at 38% effective corporate taxation out of France. Whereas if you set yourself up in, uh, in Ireland, it's, I think, 16%. So you may, you know, you're, the, the Irish have, have said, well, you know, and, and that's why Apple's in Ireland, as an example, for all of their Euro European uh, operations. So that's the type of thing that you want to be thinking about. If you want to be thinking about your tax plan. You want to be thinking about your mobility rights. You want to be keep an eye out for the 183-day rule. Make sure that you don't, that you're, the people that either you bring in or the time that you spend outside, you don't become a tax resident of, an, of another country. Which, which has nothing to do with with uh, physical residency. It's just the fact that you are you, you're kicking over the, uh, in the 183 day rule. Our, you know that with our electronic uh, passport that they know when you came in, they know when you came out, and they are exchanging information. So they're capable of building a, uh, a chart. And if you're of substantial revenue and uh, the taxation rate is more in the other in another country, well, it, it's going to end up catching up with you. And there's there's also uh, the presence in a, in a, in a foreign country of either, either if, you, if you're doing business in that country, so then you're going to be subject to the corporate tax rate of that country. So, so there, there would be individual taxation and corporate taxation that you need, you need to be thinking about. And, and these are kind of like, you know, when I say take the time to think about this, where do you want to do business? What's the taxation rate? How do I get my money out? How do I get my people in? How do I get my products in? How are my products properly? Um, certified. The rule of origin, and I have a horror story, and I've got about a minute and a half to tell you. In, in the Spec City area, we have a manufacturer that, they, that converts garbage trucks. They freight liners and then put a, a, a garbage truck unit on the back. They have to deliver, deliver something to Kenneth Bunkport, and for those who don't know, that's where the bush is coming. Some are residents, but it's a straight line from Quebec City to Kenneth Bunkport. And they go through a remote Border station where the guy has nothing to do and shows up, pops up their certificate of order. The guy says, I want, I want the uh, justification. Why is this a Canadian product? So the driver has, he looks at, I don't know. Well, they post the bond and then we're stuck with a, at a rate of 45 days to be able to prove that every screw, widget, and, and uh, material that is in that product qualifies the product as being Canadian. A little bit of practical advice, always have a, your own audit with your supply chain people to know what are the components of your product to make sure that they are Canadian origin products. There's an article about that too in, in the materials that, that we've given you. Um, so know your suppliers, know your product, uh, be, uh, have documents for um, uh, future audits, and uh, train your staff just to be aware on this. Conclusion. Okay, so the finish line, we think it's less than 12 months before this thing's in force. Um, we know that U.S. is coming. They're probably four years behind, so there's, an advantage, there's a strategic advantage that, that, that seeing businesses will have um, for, for a four-year period in terms of their, of their access to the European market. For the Europeans, um, having access to, to the Canadian market is a, is, a, is a trial ground. Having access to 
the U.S. market, he says, we don't do business the same way. And there's a sociological, there's an there's, there's, uh, issue here that people will have to, to, to fine tune. Um, you know, uh, in North America, video conference and, uh, uh, and not necessarily meeting face to face is, 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 is par for the course in the way we do business today. In Europe, it's not like that. You need to spend time uh, face to face with the people that you're going to be doing business with. Um, and I think that we're going to have an occidental trading block. Uh, with common trading values to deal with the behavior of, of, of Russia. Uh, we may be going back to where we were uh, with gas uh, after the war. So my, my message to you as we get over, at, uh, we, we got to uh, 9.30 is know the rules, uh, be, uh, be prepared, and we're here to help. All right. <clears throat> now, I don't know if there are any questions. There are no email questions to us at the moment. So does anyone have any questions? If they do not, we, or we can take these questions after we conclude. But 9.30 was our target finish line, and we are there. So the uh, floor is open. Does anyone have a question? If not, yes, Norrell. Um, I have a question with regards to uh, the Senate harmonization. Does that apply to some people? Um, I don't yeah, there will be uh, an increased cooperation. On the, on the pharmaceutical side, uh, the goal and it takes time to achieve this. The FDA and the Canadian drug uh, are still, you know, even 30 years out are are uh, having the independent process. Right. Uh, but we understand, of course, if you get your FDA, that you, you know, you're not really going to have necessarily the issue of getting your system even when a lot of a lot of small pharmaceutical companies go get their FDA, uh, knowing that that will be more onerous. So uh, the expectation is there will still be national certification, but that the standards and, and, re and mutual recognition of the FDA will harmonize it and make it easier. All the easy That's that's the expectation. Right? Um, but yeah, we're, we're so is there any indication that they're going to be relaxing some of the tariffs on? Uh, as you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a difficult one. Uh, the, the dairy producers, at least here, at least in Canada, are, are up, up in us. We saw that, that huge debate when uh, they talked about a consensus partnership. Um, <coughs> the quotas are still, are, are, are still uh, going to be there. They're, they're, they're already complaining that the increase. So but I think the short answer is another. Before we go any further, if you wouldn't mind repeating your question for our webinar audience, I forgot to repeat the question. So, Marella, could you just say, would you mind just... Uh, you know, but you, you guys could repeat Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll repeat it. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So, the, the first question was, um, uh, is, is there going to be a harmonization in terms of regulation on uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, approvals? And the second question was, is, there, is Canada going to relax the tariff uh, levels uh, for the importing of cheese? else? Anyone else? All right, well, we'll close the meeting and thank you all for coming and uh, hopefully we will do this again in the uh, once this uh, uh, agreement is implemented and we get a better practical uh, application of all these rules. Thank well, you. One, one of the things yeah. that it, it's time to do a strategic plan. If you want to go to Europe, you have to start thinking about it, start yeah. thinking on multiple aspects on your tax, your mobility, your commercial, is your IP protected in, in, in Europe or is, for the Europeans, is the IP protected in Canada? You know, do you have the proper barriers, barriers in place? That, you know, 500 million people and you've got a good idea it's not protected, trust me, someone's going to stop you. So, you know, take the time that we have to prepare yourself. Have a plan. And be well advised. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce and Didier. That was a, a very informative presentation. We were truly blessed to have the chance to listen to you speak today. Um, before we sign off online, I just wanted to um, remind each of you that in the next few days, I will distribute a copy of the presentation, a recording of the webinar, as well as Bruce and Didier's contact details. 
I know that there was a little bit of um, audio difficulty here and there, so if there's anything that um, you missed or if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to read out, reach out directly to Bruce and Didier. Um, they'd be happy to help answer any questions. With that, um, thank you again for taking the time to join us, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Goodbye. Connect.